Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Steve Amon. I'm a cardiologist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and the director of our hypertrophic cardiomyopathy clinic. I'd like to welcome today Dr. Hartzell Schaff, uh, who is one of the leaders in cardiac surgery for the treatment of patients with symptomatic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Hartzell, thank you for being here. Thank you. Can you give us a sketch of the history of myectomy and surgical management of HCM at Mayo Clinic? Well, the earliest cases that were done were performed by Dr. John Kirkland and Dr. Dwight Magoon. Um, those surgeons performed septal myectomies. Uh, there were a variety of techniques that were used in the early days, transaortic myectomy, uh, transventricular septal myectomy. Um, and at the same time, Glenn Morrow was, was doing this operation at the NIH in Bethesda. But the Mayo Clinic has really had a long history of, of uh, surgical treatment for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And so how has that technique evolved from the original myotomy to the procedure that you're performing now? Can you give us a little bit of uh, insight to that? Right. As you mentioned, the first, the first operations were called myotomy, myectomy, because in some cases the surgeons just made a slit in the septum to try to open up the outflow tract. In other cases, the the sept, uh, a small piece of muscle was taken from the septum and then that was widened further uh, digitally. Now we do what we call and, and others call an extended septal myectomy, which is, is, a, is a wider excision of the septum beneath the aortic valve, but also it extends more towards the apex of the heart because we found that most patients that have recurrent obstruction have recurrence because the surgeon did not take muscle far enough towards the apex. So if you extend that towards the apex, it improves outcomes. Can you describe what you think is the ideal patient for myectomy? Well, the, the, the patients that we see most commonly are, are patients who are very symptomatic with exertional dyspnea or chest pain or, or, or syncope. Um, and the patients have failed medical treatment um, and, and are really quite limited. And it, it's interesting, there's, there, in my experience, there's two groups of patients. Some of them become symptomatic quite rapidly and, and they will tell you when their symptoms developed almost to the month. And we see them within six to 12 months of the onset of their symptoms. There's another group of patients who, who really become symptomatic very slowly and seem to live around their disability as we, as we say sometimes because they're almost like the patients that had rheumatic mitral valve disease. They just slow down, they slow down, they avoid those activities, those stairs, uh, the walks that they used to take. So a few patients have been symptomatic longer. The patients we see, I'd say most often, are patients in their 40s and 50s who become symptomatic over 12 months. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is less common than coronary artery disease and valvular disease in our patients. So the number of myectomy procedures is relatively small compared to that. Can you make comments about the expertise required to do a myectomy and kind of where you think this is going as a, as a specialty uh, in terms of the surgical approach? Well, this, this is a very interesting point. I, I recall as a resident, um, I wondered, and I talked to one of our staff physicians and asked why we weren't doing any myectomies. And, and I was told that there were so few that were necessary, they could all be done in Bethesda by Dr. Andrew Morrow, who was a pioneer in this area. And that seemed to make sense to me that if there weren't very many to be done. But a couple of things have happened. I think, first of all, the number of patients who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is really quite large. And the number of patients who have obstruction with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is much greater than we used to think. Uh, we used to think that patients had to have high resting gradients to be candidates for surgery. Uh, and we used to think that, that obstruction only occurred in a minority of patients, 10 or 15 percent. Now we know that obstruction occurs and in, in, in in accounts for symptoms in over maybe 70 percent of patients. So it's a much larger pool of patients, even though, as you point out, it, it's less common than coronary artery disease. We've done over 2,000 myectomies at, at Mayo Clinic, and so we have a, a very large experience with it. Um, I, I think it's true that, that in most practices, surgical practices, these, these patients don't come along very often, but we, we do have a large experience here. So 
In terms of the expertise required to do it, if a surgeon's not seeing referrals for HCM very often, what sort of volume or experience should someone have before they tackle a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy from a surgeon's standpoint? Well, that's, that's a difficult area uh, for a couple reasons. First of all, it's, it's not only the number of cases that you have to see and to do to, to gain some experience. It's a difficult operation to teach people to do because the, the visualization is not, is not good. Uh, it's, it's one of those uh, surgical procedures where the surgeon may have adequate uh, exposure, but it's difficult for everybody else in the operating room to see. So it's, it's, it's harder to teach residents to do this operation than other residents. So it, it, if, a, if a resident saw or scrubbed on five or 10 cases during the course of three years of the residency, the number of cases that they really saw and, and could right. say, I know how to do it because you put the knife right here is much, much less than that. Now, how many cases do you have to do before you become comfortable? I, I would say in my own practice, I think it was certainly 15 or 20 before you feel like you know the anatomy well. It's true that it's an area that you may have some exposure to if you're a congenital surgeon and you're doing uh, membranectomies or, or limited myectomies for congenital subaortic stenosis. But I, I think extensive myectomies uh, is, is difficult to teach people. You have also um, pioneered uh, an approach to patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who have such severe hypertrophy, they almost have no ventricular chamber, so their stroke volume is limited by the amount of hypertrophy rather than obstruction. Can you talk about your approach to those patients? Right. Um, most or some patients with apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have symptoms due to diastolic dysfunction, not just related to the intrinsic stiffness of the muscle or the thickness of the free wall, but due to the fact that their chamber size is small. And it occurred to us that these patients uh, might improve if you remodel the ventricle by enlarging it. Now, in apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the apex really doesn't move at all. There's no contraction. So to make an incision there doesn't hurt the patient in the end. So we can make a small, um, one inch or one and a half inch incision just at the apex of the heart and enlarge the ventricle through that uh, uh, aperture. And it's, it's interesting in the cases we've done, and I think we've done about 60 operations this way for enlarging the ventricle, um, we have seen improvement in diastolic function. Rick Nishimura, as you know, has done some post-op casts in the patients and looked at pressure volume loops and it, I think has pretty clearly demonstrated that you improve diastolic function. Now, the other side of that is a lot of patients with, with apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have no symptoms and, and don't need the, the operation, but certainly if they have a lot of heart failure, short of a transplant, this is really the only surgical option for them. The, the approach is also helpful for patients with midventricular obstruction, and we've seen another 40 or 50 patients who have had operation for midventricular obstruction, and we've used the same approach through the apex because for true midventricular obstruction, it's very difficult or impossible to get it through the transaortic approach. Thank you. And thank you for your collaboration on our HCM patients. It's been quite a successful endeavor uh, with a combination of cardiology and cardiac surgery at Mayo Clinic over the years. Thank you. I want to thank the audience for joining us today uh, and invite you to uh, come back soon to view more conversations uh, with Mayo Clinic cardiology and cardiovascular surgery.